Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll just start with a couple quick announcements. Um, those of you that participate in our conference calls, we have a couple things coming up. On Thursday, January 24th, Dr. Inga Jolly, who is a graduate of our Diet and Lifestyle uh, program and also um, in the Wellness Forum now, located here at Wellness Forum, is going to do a teleconference call at 9 p.m. Eastern on sports injuries. Uh, Dr. Jolly is an osteopathic physician and use, uh, uses osteopathic manipulation in order to help people recover from injuries and structural abnormalities and that sort of thing. So um, sports injuries, that doesn't mean you have to be a professional athlete. I mean, I, I've had sports injuries from working out at the gym and running and that sort of thing too, and I'm not a professional athlete. So I think a lot of people might benefit from this. And then Monday, January 20th, Conversations with Chef Dell. As usual, during this uh, particular conference call series, Dell will pick um, uh, a topic to discuss for the first 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, hearty soups and stews, which is great for this cold weather we're experiencing here in the north. And then the rest of the time, he'll spend answering your questions about um, health and food preparation and, and all that sort of thing. And so we also make sure you guys you get emailed the recipes if you uh, participate in the class. So. For information about any of that, call our office at 614-841-7700. I have two topics I want to cover today, and one is revisiting the idea of mammography, and maybe some of you think, my gosh, how much is this woman going to talk about mammography before we've just heard enough already? Well, as long as billions of dollars are being spent in this country for women to get unnecessary mammograms, I guess I'm going to keep talking about it. And uh, there are a couple of aspects of this I want to talk about. One is that um, many of you probably have noticed that your insurance costs, your health insurance costs went up this year, in spite of the fact that um, you may not be making claims. If you live like I do, you don't make claims. Well, there are a couple of reasons why insurance premiums are going up. And you might have heard the headlines that um, many, many insurance companies are petitioning states for permission to raise policy premiums as much as 20%. Well, the first reason is that all of us healthy people, particularly if we have individual health insurance or small group policies, we're pooled with all of the other unhealthy people out there. So um, as a result, no matter how well we take care of ourselves, our premiums go up because we're helping to pay for all the people who don't take care of themselves, which is kind of irritating, but we're stuck with it. The other reason is that there are new mandates determining what um, insurance companies have to cover, and one of those is mammography. And if mammography was effective, I really wouldn't care, uh, but it isn't. And so the fact that I not only have to take care of all these sick people by paying higher premiums myself, but I have to pay for a bunch of stuff that is useless and harmful can really get you irritated. And somebody actually sent me an email this morning and said, doesn't this stuff make you crazy? I said, well, it does make me crazy, but it also makes me motivated why I'm sitting in front of the camera talking to all of you today. Um, so anyway, I want to talk about a new review published in the New England Journal of Medicine, co-authored by Gilbert Welch, that illustrates why this mammography thing, how we need to get the word out about it. You might remember, if you've been a long-time listener and reader of my stuff, that Gilbert Welch has authored two great books. One is Should I Get Tested for Cancer, and the other is Overdiagnosed, in which he deals with this issue of overdiagnosis and overtreatment and that sort of thing. And um, So he and his colleagues um, access data from the surveillance epidemiology and end results data from 1976 through uh, 2008. And what they looked at was the incidence of early stage breast cancer or carcinoma in situ and late stage breast cancer in women age 40 and older. Now, if mammography were effective, what you should see is an increase in the detection of early stage cancer and a decrease in the detection of late stage cancer. In other words, the promise of mammography is if we catch it early, then we won't have people dying of breast cancer. Now the data shows that there has been an increase in the diagnosis of early stage cancer, more than doubling from 112 to 234 cases per 100,000 women. And you might think to yourself, well, that sounds like a good thing. We're diagnosing it early. But the diagnosis of late stage cancer has only dropped by eight cases per 100,000. So we haven't seen the decrease in late stage cancer that we should be seeing. Now, based on the assumptions used to promote mammography, only eight of the 234 women per 100,000 diagnosed with breast cancer would develop advanced disease, which means that 226 women per 100,000 are treated unnecessarily. The researchers concluded that during the last 30 years, 1.3 million women were overdiagnosed. You heard me right, 1.3 
million. In 2008 alone, over 70,000 women were overdiagnosed. And understand what overdiagnosed means. It means, first of all, being uh, diagnosed with carcinoma in situ, which may usually, in fact, 92% of the time, doesn't progress to um, any type of cancer that requires treatment. But these women receive biopsies, uh, more mammograms. They, uh, many of them had surgery. Uh, a great deal of them had radiation, some chemotherapy, some are taking aromatase inhibitors. This costs a lot of money and it does not improve a woman's health. The researchers concluded that, quote, screening is having, at best, only a small effect on the rate of death from breast cancer. And the Cochrane collaboration um, figured at one point in time that 2,000 women have to be screened for five years to save one life. So this is not a very effective tool. But the facts don't seem to sway the proponents of mammography. Um, and one of the reasons, let's face it, billions of dollars are at stake here. Not just for the tests, but think of the billions of dollars that are spent on the unnecessary treatment. Medscape and other medical sites featured articles recently saying, um, in response to Welch's study, quoting experts, and I use that term loosely, experts, uh, saying that, um, insisting that everybody knows that mammography saves lives. And I find it interesting because when I was talking about Peter Gacci's book, which I read last summer and reported to you about, um, one of Gacci's uh, comments, he says, when, when they're trying to fight with you and they can't do it on the science, they just use the everybody knows lines. Everybody knows that this is the right thing to do. Um, they cite no legitimate research to back their claims, no legitimate criticism of the data included in the analysis, but instead, just like those who continued to insist for a long time that the Earth was flat and that it was the center of the universe, um, they just continue to scream louder and hope that the sheer force of their will will continue to make others believe they're right. And that has worked to a certain extent. But the world has become a different place recently. And uh, those who speak scientific truth have a great weapon on their side. It's the internet. That's how you guys are listening and watching this little broadcast right now. Uh, which can quickly get information out to others and um, help to change their mind about many things, including medical treatment. So send this to women who are still getting mammograms. And don't say stop getting a mammogram. Just say, listen, why don't you watch this? And on the off chance that this woman might know something you don't know, why don't you look into it? And you can share other articles on this topic from the Health Priest Online Library and recommend that these women read Gachi's book. And I'm confident that they will arrive at the same conclusion, uh, which is that mammography is useless and often very harmful. So moving on to the next topic, I want to talk about salt and hypertension in children. And um, there's a, a continuing theme in so much of the stuff I talk about. Um, one is the importance of dietary excellence, you guys know that. The other is that so much of the data that's published is wrong. And the third thing is that so much of it is misreported. The increasing incidence of hypertension in children is concerning. It should be to everybody. It is to me. It doesn't seem to be decreasing. It is appropriate to invest resources in doing something about it. The problem is that many times what we're trying to do about it doesn't make the problem better and is very misdirected. So a recent study in pediatrics concluded that salt is the major culprit in the development of hypertension in children. And this belief about salt being a villain is very pervasive in medicine for people of all ages. The data were drawn from an NHANES, uh, from NHANES data on children between the ages of eight and 18 years. And 37% of the kids were overweight or obese. The average sodium consumption was 3,387 milligrams a day. Increased sodium consumption was associated with increased hypertension and this association was stronger in kids who were overweight or obese. So the implied conclusion was that salt restriction was responsible and that lowering salt, uh, lowering salt consumption would lower blood pressure. And commentary about this study from public health authorities and spokespersons for the American Heart Association declared that salt is the villain and we really need to pay attention to salt. The problem is the interpretation of the study results, um, very uh, misdirected. The study didn't evaluate the effects of other dietary factors on hypertension, nor did it evaluate the source of the sodium in the children's diet. Both kids and adults consuming the standard American diet take in most of their salt from dairy and other animal foods and from processed junk foods. It's these foods and their effect on weight gain combined with lack of physical activity that causes hypertension. A child who consumes, or an adult for that matter, who consumes a wellness forum style plant-based diet 
um, will lose weight and blood pressure will go down without any restriction of salt most of the time. Now, the salt will naturally come down in the diet because of the dairy being eliminated and the reduction in animal foods consumption and highly processed foods and that sort of thing, but we don't need to restrict it any further. And since people have taste receptors for salt on their tongues and like the taste of salt, boy, my gosh, if that'll make them eat rice and broccoli, we need to encourage them to salt their foods. Well, anyway, this study and its misreporting represents the typical reductionist approach to health, which Dr. Campbell addresses really well in his new book called Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. It will be out soon, and I promise I'll have much more to say about it when it is released and published. While it appears easier to manipulate you know, one dietary factor, one food, and I think that's why people gravitate toward this kind of thing, and researchers love to promote this idea. If we just get rid of salt, if we just cut the fat, if we eat low-fat dairy products instead of full-fat dairy products, if you restrict yourself to two cookies, everybody's trying to find some minor manipulation that's going to change health. It never works. It hasn't worked. Look at what's happened to people during all the years that this type of small manipulation has been going on. The only thing that works is to change the whole dietary pattern. And this brings me back to the point of the salt, which is where I started. Reducing salt without changing everything else in the diet is a misdirected way of approaching this whole thing. And um, the problem with kids is not salt consumption. It's weight, it's their whole dietary pattern. If we wanna reduce the incidence of blood pressure, uh, problems, hypertension, and, and all of the other health issues that kids have, we've gotta get them on a health-promoting plant-based diet. Well, that's all the news for today. Uh, have a wonderful day as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think would benefit from watching it. I'll be back on Thursday.